Welcome to Podcast on the Brink, your weekly dose of Indiana basketball news and discussion, brought to you by the Assembly Call and Inside the Hall. I'm your host, Jared Morris. Join me live at assemblycall.com every Thursday night and immediately following every IU game for our live IU postgame show. And visit insidethehall.com for complete coverage of IU basketball and to join the discussion in the Inside the Hall premium forum. On this week's edition of Podcast on the Brink, Alex Bozich and I are joined by John Crispin from the Big Ten Network. John will be on the call for Indiana's important matchup against Rutgers. We get John's perspective on that game and why this battle against Rutgers is going to be tougher uh, than most fans may realize if you haven't been paying attention to uh, the recent resurgence of the Scarlet Knights. And we also talk to John about Indiana's struggles and his thoughts on why those struggles have appeared and what Indiana might be able to do to snap out of it. That and much more. We always enjoy our conversations with John, and this one certainly is no exception. So that is coming up here on this edition of Podcast on the Brink. Before we get to that, a quick word about our sponsor this week, SeatGeek. As you know, getting tickets online can be far too complicated. With hundreds of sites and varying levels of reliability, it's hard to know who to trust. But that's why SeatGeek is the way to go. SeatGeek pulls millions of tickets into one place so you can easily find the seats you want for a price you're willing to pay. There's nothing quite like being there in person, and SeatGeek will get you closer to the action for a great value. If you live close to the rack in Piscataway, You can pick up tickets on SeatGeek and go watch this game between Indiana and Rutgers. And the Hoosiers, of course, still have six more home games that you can go to. And SeatGeek has great prices for all of those tickets. And one of the things that makes SeatGeek really special is that the entire site is actually designed to make your ticket buying experience easier. And they do this by searching multiple ticket sites and grading every ticket based on a value or on the value of the ticket. And in that way, SeatGeek helps you immediately identify the best seats that fit your budget. It's like a color-coded system. You just look and you can identify it right away. And every purchase is fully guaranteed. So you can shop for tickets on SeatGeek with confidence. I have the SeatGeek app on my phone. It's what I use for sports tickets, for concert tickets, and I highly recommend it to you as well. Best of all, Podcast on the Brink listeners get $10 off your first SeatGeek purchase. Just download the SeatGeek app and enter the promo code BRINK today. That's promo code BRINK, B-R-I-N-K. And get $10 off your first SeatGeek purchase. SeatGeek, life's an event, we have the tickets. And now, here's our conversation with John Crispin. And we are joined this week on Podcast on the Brink by John Crispin, who will be calling the important Indiana Rutgers game coming up on Wednesday night. John, how you doing? Thanks again for, uh, for stopping by Podcast on the Brink. I'm good. I'm I'm one of the very few around the Big Ten who actually is enjoying the craziness of the conference so far. I think a lot of people are tied to one program or another, and it makes it just torturous. Whereas I'm just a basketball fan. This has been this has been quite a ride. Yeah, enjoyment not really a word that I would associate with Indiana basketball in particular over the uh, over the last six games. When you when you watch Indiana play right now, what do you see? I see indecisiveness and insecurity. And that's really, that's really, that's what I see. But again, that's always a byproduct of a number of different things. And injuries plays a, plays a role. Competitiveness in practice, you know, a lack of an attention to detail, a, a lack of buying into the detail, uh, which can be tied back to not having the type of competition you need in practice because it's hard to hold guys accountable when they have to play. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things, a lot of challenges going against the Hoosiers, but the things that they can control, they haven't been able to control either. And that's, that's just playing hard, playing tough, uh, playing with confidence. And I think those are the things that have been lost. That's probably why it's been so frustrating. As a former player yourself, when you see guys playing like you described, you know, not tough, you know, not playing hard, some of those things that you can control – where do you place the responsibility for that? Do you think that's more on the players individually themselves, or is that more on the coach? Well, you know, I, I go back to my experience at UCLA, and because uh, I, I think UCLA and Indiana are similar in many ways based on the expectations of the university, the expectations of that program. Uh, I, I get that. And, and also, they, they want to attract the same type of kid in terms of four- or five-star recruits, high-level guys, especially the local talent. Um, they have to get those kids. Well, so it, they're very similar in that regard. And at UCLA, it was the guys on the team, the players who didn't play hard. 
coaches work their tail off. Coaches have so much pride in what they do that you have no idea how hard they're really working. And the stuff that you see is, you know, minor adjustments in the game, substitution patterns, different rotations, you know, maybe playing Juwan at the three or four and not the five. I mean, there's, there's those rotations that you see, but what you don't see is how a coach has to invest an absorbent amount of time into each individual to figure out how to motivate them, to figure out how to bring them a little bit closer to that common goal that's sitting in the middle of the room. And, and it's a challenge to do so. And you need to use all your resources in that process. And one of those resources that coaches use is competition. And, and I really feel like if, if I could point to anything that should give Archie a pass right now, it's the fact that he has not been able to force guys to be competitive in practice which also means they're not going to be as motivated to do the little things in the game because the threat of not playing just isn't there. They don't have the bodies for it. So I really do. I put the things that you can control, I put on the player. Coaches, believe me, they are trying to get it right. They have more pride in this than you can imagine. They work their entire lives to get to this point. We think of as uber successful guys and the, the expectations are there and you're being paid to, to win basketball games. Well, look, they didn't start that way. You know, these are all guys that work their way up into the situation that they're in and they want, they want it more than anybody else. They really do. So in terms of the things that you can control, I do, I put it on the players that you got to be mentally tough and fight through whatever adversity you're going to have, because you still need to show up and compete. You mentioned adversity, and obviously Indiana is going through a ton of it right now. But one thing that's kind of been a constant throughout this season, and I'm sure you've talked about it uh, on broadcast, is getting off the slow starts. And I'm curious from your yeah. perspective, is that um, is that something at this point of the season that a team can turn around? Or is that – I mean, because Indiana, I would say 60 to – Jared, maybe you can – uh, chime in here too, but I would say at least sixty to seventy percent of the time this year is getting off on um, to poor starts. Is that a is that something Indiana can change going forward, or is that the sign of a young team or a team that's not particularly on the same page, uh, game uh, in and game out? Yeah, I, I would say, and I, and I don't want to question their chemistry as individuals off the floor, but but there's a lack of chemistry on the floor. There's a lack of continuity, and which also leads to a lot of thinking. And when you get when you get in that mindset of thinking through things and and trying to think too much about what you need to do, even your defensive rotations, you get really indecisive. And I think that's what leads to what Archie's been talking about. We have guys that look scared. It's not that they're scared. None of these guys are scared of anybody, and Archie knows that. But they might be scared of the situation, afraid because of what they don't know, afraid because of their indecisiveness or the insecurity that they feel. Which, I mean this might as well be a couch session. I mean, we're talking about players that expect to win at a higher level when they don't, who are they? So this has been a shot to their identity as much as anything else. So, it's, and you see kids that have not really responded to me, Juwan Morgan, he responds. There's never been an issue. Juwan plays his butt off. He plays whatever role he's asked to play. He responds, but I don't see that from everybody else. I don't see that same confidence in terms of give me the ball and let me get a stop. I don't see that from the rest of the guys. And I think it really comes back to that, that bit of indecision, that bit of insecurity that really eliminates the confidence, which in turn, I don't know, roundabout way, it just takes the rhythm out of the game. You know, if you're not playing with confidence and, and, and walking into the rhythm and then playing with the rhythm of the game, you're never going to get into it. And I think that's part of what the issue is that they've never been able to dictate the pace and without confidence, it's going to get harder and harder. Archie's talked about, you know, just kind of trying to get one win and then maybe you can springboard that into something else. Obviously, this situation is going to be tough because they play Rutgers. And even if they're able to win yeah. that game, they got they got to go to Michigan State next. So nobody ex- expects it to be, a, you know, the start of a winning streak. But is there anything to that? Um, maybe drawing on your um, experiences as a player, is it is it a matter of, you know, maybe you do get one win and then you get some some of those things back. You get that confidence, that that feeling that you can be successful again. Is that is that really what it comes down to? Well, I mean, truth be told, you can get that confidence in a loss, um, but it's but it's got to be true and organic. I mean, you have to know you played well. You have to know that you played hard. You have to know that you did 
all the things that you were asked to do, and that put you guys in a great position to win. So you can even get that in a good loss. Now, I don't think you can get it uh, losing to Rutgers, and I'm not taking anything away from Rutgers. I think they've done a great job with that program, but it's not the same as playing Michigan State really well. I think you could feel really good about playing a Michigan State team with that type of physicality, great guard play. If you play them really well, you should feel pretty good about it, regardless of whether you win or lose. But there are some matchups like Rutgers and, and Ohio State right now. Those are games that you feel like you have to win. And I think, they, yes, it's good to get a win, but the most important thing you can do is just develop more of a carefree, confident, cocky, humble arrogance type of mindset. And, and there's a few guys on this team that really do exemplify that, but it's got to be a collective whole. And that's, that's been the real issue is getting everybody on the same page. John, you were a good shooter during your career, especially from the outside. And, you know, this Indiana team spent a decent amount of the season actually shooting a pretty good percentage from deep, but that has absolutely cratered during this losing streak. Hoosiers now shooting 25% from three point range in Big Ten play, which is dead last. I'm curious if Archie said, Hey, John we're having a crisis with our shooting confidence. I want you to come in and work with these guys for a week. You know, be, be our shot doctor. Try to help get these guys going. What drills would you have them do? What would you tell them? What would be your strategy to try to help get this team shooting with more confidence so that they can actually get a little bit more spacing on the court? Well, first and foremost, it goes back to what you're doing offensively to get those open looks. And from there, what open looks are you looking to get? I mean, that's the thing. It's not like, oh, we, we just want to skip it, and if we're open, shoot it. Now, you have to train guys to look for certain shots because when you seek out the shot prior to shooting the basketball, you actually get you gain confidence. So when you actually rotate to a certain spot as drawn up, as planned, as by design, when you rotate to that spot, you're stepping into the shot. The second you get the, the catch, you're rising fire. And there's a confidence in that shot that just isn't there on the, the ball swinging around the perimeter and you happen to be open shot. It's not the same confidence. It's not the same rhythm. So, so I would make more of a point to run options, sets, act, different actions on the offensive end that give us a certain look from three, whether it's an inside out, a drive that gets downhill and a kick out, a little European action where it's a drive to the baseline and, and, and the other player goes behind. I mean, those are shots that you can get in the college basketball game because of the way teams help. So I, I would I would focus more on the type of shots we're getting and, and less, around, uh, less about the shooters because these are all guys that can shoot the basketball. I mean, it's, it's funny when you think about some of the guys that struggle to shoot the basketball at times. I watch Ethan Happ shoot free throws. This guy makes every one. He makes every a free throw in practice. It's simply mental, and that's it. So if anything, I would get out of their heads and, and really – give them confidence in, in certain looks that we're trying to get. And I think it just takes time because the offense has struggled to find that continuity, the spacing, and, and, and the consistent movement that they need to get those particular shots. Hey, I'm going to jump in here real quick for a word from our other sponsor this week, our friends at Home Field. As you know, homefieldapparel.com is the place where you will find the comfiest and most unique licensed IU apparel that is available anywhere. Started by an IU grad, all Home Field apparel is designed and printed out of Indianapolis. And now that we are well into 2019 and the winter and it's frigid, frigid cold outside right now, you can turn back the clock with Homefield's 1910 IU Crest sweatshirt featuring an IU Crest from 1910 on a tri-blend fleece crew neck. And by the way, if you like that tri-blend fleece material, then you should also check out the hoodie that has the old school IU Bison logo. I love that. You've heard me talk about it in these ad spots all season long, but it is by far my favorite sweatshirt. Uh, I gave it to a lot of people as gifts this year. They all liked it, so that is definitely one to think about as well. It will keep you warm on these cold winter nights when the only thing colder than the temperatures is I use outside shooting. But hey, hopefully that turns around starting Wednesday night at Rutgers. Uh, so again, go to homefieldapparel.com. Don't forget to use the promo code BRINK at checkout, B-R-I-N-K. You will get 15% off your first order at homefieldapparel.com. Homefield, wear one for the team. And now back to our conversation with John Crispin. Juwan Morgan, Romeo Langford, obviously this team's you know stars and the guys that they run the offense through. Who do you think, if Indiana's going to bust out of this losing streak, make something of the rest of this season, who do you think is kind of the next most important guy that needs to emerge as a consistent player, especially on offense? I mean, really, it's 
it's a shame he's been hurt, but it's it's Deron Davis. I, I mean, I, I know I, I'm not sure where he's at if he's <laughs> where he's at in, on his comeback, but that guy is so important to them because it allows them to play through the post without it being Jawan Morgan. It, it forces an ISO situation in the post, and then then you're then you're able to make reads around that and cut to the basket. You know, float around the perimeter. It, it just gives you a balance offensively that they otherwise don't have because of the lack of the confidence in three point shooting and the plan Juwan Morgan where he's gonna get double teams. It, it it takes you out of the offensive rhythm. And I think that's been the tough thing is with Juwan at the five, and even if he's not playing the five, he's still posting up. He's still your post player. Even if Justin Smith is technically your five, Juwan's your post player. And it actually takes you out of the movement and the rhythm of the offense that you need to continue to build. And I think that's kind of what's led to the stagnant offense at time, the, the lack of continuity. Like I said, no ball movement at times, just a, a dribble weave 25 feet from the basket. There, there's no real attack. There's no real threat, nothing to keep the defense honest. So I think uh, talking uh, talking a lot about that, I know I just ran my mouth for a while, but I really do. It's a shame because Deron Davis, to me, is really important to that offense. Offensively, John, there's been a lot written, a lot talked about on this podcast and, and other you know, IU folks that cover IU, just kind of about what Indiana is doing offensively right now and kind of how, you know, the opposing defenses, once we've gotten into the thick of Big Ten play here, has is, is kind of realized that, you know, Romeo and Jawan strengths and kind of at times just not guarded other guys on the court. Zach McRoberts, even Justin Smith talked about it a little bit. What can they do differently, maybe offensively, if anything, at this point to to kind of get things kick started there? Is there anything you see that they could be doing differently with Romeo Lankford? Anything they could be doing differently with Jawan? Or is it kind of what it is uh, at this point and and maybe there isn't anything they can do besides make shots from the perimeter to to kind of get out of this funk i think it's easy from the surface to say there's some things that they can do uh, but i also understand and respect what coaches go through in terms of trying to build with the system that he wants to run going forward now they haven't progressed to where they're going to be yet they really haven't you can tell they're, they're not getting to option two or three let alone four five or six i mean they're just not there yet and that has a lot to do with injuries. It has a lot to do with just things take time. And sometimes when you have a star and, and quite frankly, two stars, you rely on them too heavily. And you just trust that in a late shot clock situation, we've got guys that can make a play. So, uh, so I think it, it's, it's a number of things. I, I do feel like the dribble weave at time gets too, get that uh, it gets too easy to defend teams just sag off of it. They sag off of it. And you never really are able to turn the corner. It always gets forced out wide. And defense is basically just staying a shell. It's like a shell drill. So, so the, I would get away from the dribble weave at times, try to play off of a high post. Even if it's a flash to the high post, let guys like Romeo Langford come off that high post area, that pinch post area, whether it be a, a dribble handoff, a flare screen on the opposite side. That really, those little things right there just change how you defend. It forces the defense to make decisions. Whereas right now, the reason why everybody's been able to defend Indiana is they haven't really had to make many decisions. And when you make decisions, you also make sacrifices. So if I go to help, I'm going to sacrifice my man possibly getting a basket unless my teammate takes it away. So you force the defense into tough situations, and then you make the read from there. I just don't think Indiana's gotten to the point yet where they've been forcing defenses to make decisions. So I think there's a lot of little things that they could do, but I know Archie's got a progression too. And it's hard to kind of jump on and say from the surface, Hey, you could be running this set, this set, and this set that gets you into action A, B, C, or D when there's a lot more going on that I simply don't see. I may see a few layers deep, but, but ultimately the coaching staff understands to the core of their own team. So, so there's only so much I could really say, but I do know there's some actions that could be helping them. Tomorrow's game with Rutgers, obviously a big one for, for the Hoosiers if they're going to, you know, keep their, I guess, tournament hopes alive. Right now it's, it's you know, everyone's talking as if the program's in free fall, but I've seen a couple of the brackets come out and they're still they're still in all the brackets. So it's not like they, they can't turn this around if they can start pu- putting together some wins. But, you know, I, I've looked a lot at Rutgers and, you know, they're obviously a team with a lot of size, but not a very good shooting team. What kind of what do you see as maybe the, the one or two keys uh, for Indiana in this game. Obviously, Rutgers plays really hard. 
Uh, so they're going to have to match their, their effort. But is there anything schematically that Indiana can exploit or are things in particular they're going to have to do well in order to win? Well, first and foremost, don't let it be sloppy. The Rutgers loves a sloppy game right now. They're so confident when the game gets messy. And I think that's what gives them confidence. So, so when you allow the game to be messy and you throw the ball around, you don't attack when you need to attack, you make careless passes because the defense just seems to be set, uh, that plays into Rutgers' favor. And what it does is it just eliminates confidence from your own team. It also eliminates trust. And that's another issue with turnovers. Every time somebody makes a consistent turnover, and by consistent turnover, I mean the guy makes the same mistake over and over again, you lose trust in your teammates. And I think Rutgers has an ability to do that to teams, whether they realize it or not. They make the game messy, and they almost force you to win in one-on-one situations. And that may play into the hands of Indiana in a positive way, because you have great playmakers, but it also could play into it in a negative way, whereas you've seen two guys just can't really carry the load in this conference. You need to have more of a balanced attack. So I would be really concerned with Rutgers, especially the way they're playing at home. They, they play with a lot of heart. They, they play with pride. They play as if they've got something to prove to everybody else in this conference, as if they were just thrown in at the last minute. And Steve Peichel's got a good thing going, but it really comes down to Indiana just taking care of the basketball, at times making the simple play. And I know that sounds basic, but make the simple play. When you have superior talent, the simple play always wins. You know, one of the things it seems like Indiana will have to do in this game is get out and transition. Rutgers, you know, the one strength they have offensively is offensive rebounding. They have a ton of size, and Indiana, you know, without Deron Davis and with Race Thompson, you know, he may get a couple minutes, but we don't know if he's going to play much. Yeah. You know, they have a big size advantage. What can Indiana do to kickstart their transition offense and get that going with some level of rhythm and consistency? Because it's been so up and down all year. Well, first and foremost, you got to rebound the, the long three. Uh, Long rebounds, I should say. Three-point shots for Rutgers. They, they don't particularly shoot the ball well from three, and they come off hard. So you have to be prepared as a guard to rebound from the perimeter. And that's something that I think we don't talk about enough. For whatever reason, we think of rebounding by you know, Jordan Murphy and Ethan Happ. Those guys are rebounders. Well, no, no. Guards have to be as good of a rebounder as the bigs do because that's the first pass of the fast break. So when the guards are active in, in rebounding, they're the ones leading the break. So it really starts with that. You secure it by having all five go after the defensive glass. And then you have multiple guys that can handle the ball. If Juwan Morgan, Romeo Langford gets a rebound, just take off. Get down the floor. You, what you're doing in that situation is you're putting the defense in scramble mode until a shot goes up. Where they have to chase, they have to just adapt to whatever it is you're doing. And, and that may be the best start to Indiana's offense. So Yes, it's just defensive rebounding. It's as simple as that, but it's got to be from the guards more so than anything else. John, it feels like Romeo's hit a bit of a rough patch here, but then I'll look at his season numbers overall. He's still averaging 17.2 points, five, almost five and a half rebounds, which is second on the team. Uh, you know, he's played all 20 games, started all 20 games, playing the most minutes of anybody on the team. You know, from your perspective and just kind of watching him throughout the season, is there... Has there anything been anything about his play that surprised you? And, and do you think that he still maybe has another gear that he can kick it into here down the stretch? And could that be the difference uh, in terms of where Indiana's season ends up? Well, to answer the, the second part first, the, I definitely think he's got another gear. And it's, it's not that he's lacking confidence. I think he's lacking comfort. And the, the comfort for him is what allows him to just play freely to make the plays that, that he wants to make as opposed to the plays that he thinks he should make. And that's really, I think, what it comes down to. If he's able to take it to that next level, it's where he's able to play with this competent, confident fearlessness, which is like, I'm just going to be instinctual. I'm just going to make reads and play. And that's really how he should be playing anyway. But, but there's a lot more that goes into that, too. That, like I talked about trust with your teammates. you got to trust the teammates can make the plays. you got to trust that they're going to be in the right spot. So there's a lot that goes into that. I do feel like he's got a, another gear to him. And, and I also feel like I would love to see him mad. I would really love to see him mad. I, I would almost lo love for someone to give him some bulletin board material because I think that's what would really bring it out. John, I know we we got to get you out of here. We want to be respectful of your time. Just kind of a general question around the conference. You know, 
you mentioned earlier, you know, how it's been enjoyable for you to watch, you know, just kind of the ups and downs and the competitiveness of everything. What, you know, teams, individual players, what has have been the things that have stood out the most to you as you've kind of made your tour around the conference? Um, I think what's uh, stood out to me the most is just the unpredictability of everything. Um, you know, I get crushed every time I do these power rankings and it, and I really want to just tell people every time I put them out, I say, look, I know I'm not right. It's just how I see it. And how I see it is based on a million different things. And I get that I'm wrong based on how everyone else sees it because I've seen this year more than ever before because of the competitiveness. The, I would, I would almost say the, the perspective of the fan base is much more positive for their own team. Now, I know that may not be the case this year, right now for Indiana, but it sure was the case with the non-conference schedule. For sure, you were feeling really good about this team. It was just the Big Ten Conference play has really been rough. Minnesota's another one where they've had some struggles, but it's still a fan base that feels really good about their team. Iowa, same thing. Ohio State have their struggles, but everyone says, gosh, but we're, you know, we, we're going to turn it around. There's, there's more positive this year than ever before, and, and I think part of that goes back to the strength of the conference, where even if you lose some games in conference, you as a fan base can look at it and say, but look how great our conference is. It's so hard to win here. I mean, look, Rutgers feels, it almost feels like they won the national championship because they won three conference games. Well, it, they should feel that way because of how difficult it is to win in this conference. So I almost feel like as competitive and tough as it is and, and how emotional games get, I feel like the, even the fan bases recognize and respect the strength of the conference, even if it comes out in an, in an indirect way. Because I, I do feel like they respect in general, just the, the, the from top to bottom, how good this conference is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, John, have a great call tomorrow night uh, at the uh, at the rack in Piscataway. We'll of course be watching, and from our perspective, anyway, hopefully Indiana can end this skid and get a much needed victory. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have I don't have a dog in the fight, but I but I you know I do have some ties to Indiana. Yes, no, no, I meant from from our perspective here, not not you. Not you personally. I know. I'm just, I'm just saying. I, I like to ingratiate myself every now and then with the Indiana fan base, just in case I say something they don't like. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Nope. You were great as always. Thanks, John. And we look forward to having you on again. Thank you, John. All right. My pleasure, guys. Thank you for listening to this episode of Podcast on the Brink. We always appreciate you being here. Remember to join me and my co-hosts for more IU basketball talk at assemblycall.com and visit Alex over at insidethehall.com for complete coverage of Indiana basketball. If you want to support Podcast on the Brink, here is the single best way to do it. Tell anyone you know who loves IU hoops about us and suggest that they subscribe. Podcast on the Brink can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else podcasts are available. Tell your social media followers, email your friends, text your family members. For weekly discussion about IU basketball, they need to be subscribed to Podcast on the Brink. We'll talk to you next time. Go Hoosiers!